All right, you may be seated. We're going to begin this year with something very important, and that is no Torah terrorists. And what do I mean by that? Well, when you have a first grader and they color a picture, you know they're all outside the lines and everything else, but you tell them how much you love it and you stick it on refrigerator for everybody to see. It's all about the heart. You don't get mad at your first grader and say, why aren't you doing it like Da Vinci and throw it away? Well, it's the same thing. When we have Christians of every denomination come in here or when you're out there talking to people, don't go bashing. You, I, there's a famous saying, he who throws mud always loses ground. Okay, we want to be positive. We want to thank them for where they're at. All right, and then just say, do you want to know more? That's why I say, guess what? There's more. And so all of us, as a believer, some are still on milk. They should be on meat, all right? But we don't, uh, let me just tell you a quick story. One thing, you don't knock Sunday keepers. You don't knock Christmas keepers. As a matter of fact, there was a, a couple who had come to uh, El Shaddai. They were kind of new to all this. And the first thing they said to me is, we're not giving up Christmas. I have $10,000 of Christmas ornaments, and I'm not giving them up. <laughs> and then they invited Vicki and I over to their house for Christmas. And we go there, and they got the big Christmas tree in the house. We don't care. We just have fun. We fellowship. Don't say a word. And then after a year of hearing the teachings, he comes to me and goes, guess what? We got rid of all of our Christmas stuff. <laughs> you know, you, the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts people. For some people, that's not the big issue. Their big issue is their spouse is abusing them. I mean, you don't know why add burdens on top of them. You know what I'm saying? So let everyone be where they're at. And if a little kid has a real sharp knife, he's playing with it. If you go try to grab it out of his hand, you're going to get cut or he's going to get cut. But if you go up and give him a piece of candy, he drops the knife and takes the candy. You have to look at alternative ways of doing things. So I don't take away Christmas. I don't take away Easter. I give them Passover. I give them Sukkot. It's not a matter of bashing people, taking things away. All that is is arrogance and pride. And so you have to stop that. Uh, this is why I speak at Christian churches all the time on Sunday. As a matter of fact, they were required to be in the temple every day of the week to do offerings, so there's nothing wrong with going to church on Sunday. Never. It's just not the Sabbath. Okay, I wish to God we'd have church every day somewhere. You know, it doesn't matter when you go, but rest on the Sabbath. Now, this is going to be so much fun, I just can't stand it. Are you ready? Does this look good? How many of you like to take a big bite out of that? Well, you all know this phrase. Give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Teach him how to fish, and what does he do? He eats for a lifetime. What we're going to do that is so exciting, I'm going to teach you how to study the Bible today. And I, because I don't, how do I say this? How many of you want to continue to feed your child? Or can you hardly wait for them to feed themselves? I don't mean to be gross, but at the same time, why can't wipe my bottom? When do you want to quit doing that? Okay, let them do it themselves. Well, it's the same thing. What I want to do is I want to teach you guys how to study so that it's mind-blowing for you on your own. The question right now is how hungry are you? We all want a piece of salmon, okay? But I'm telling you what's going to be happening in a planet near you, the time is going to come when you're going to have to fend for yourself. You can't depend on the government. You cannot depend on the government, so you have to know. And it's the same thing. I don't want you to have to depend on me to teach you the word. I want you to learn the word so you can teach it. Following me. So here's the thing. Here's the world. And we're talking about the beginning. We're starting with Genesis 1.1. Who can tell me what this word is? Bereshit, which means in the beginning. This is the first word of the Bible. And in the beginning, God created something. And what is this word? Hashemayim. Not Hashemayim, but Hashemayim. 
Okay, correct way to pronounce that. Pronounce it. Now, I want to show you something about this word. This is heaven, right? He created the heaven and the earth. You see that word right there? Who can tell me what that is, that phrase? Mayim. That, okay, and what does mayim mean? It means water. So that means, guess what? Sham, who knows what sham is in Hebrew? It's there. Like on the dreidel, they have a different letter if you're in Israel. A great miracle happened here, and outside is a great miracle happened there, and the word is sham. And so what we know about heaven is, guess what? There is water in heaven. You see that? There are words within words. Now, let me go to the next slide here. So here we have water dropping. We know there's rain. Well, you have to understand words can have different meaning. Look at Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11. As the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and doesn't return, it waters the earth, it makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. And then he says, as the rain comes down, so shall my word be. So God's word is like the rain that comes down. He says, my words be that goes out of what? Okay, so God is speaking words, and his word won't return void until it accomplishes that which I please. Okay, now watch as this unfolds. Look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 2. My teaching drops as what? The rain. My speech distills as the dew, like gentle rain up upon the tender grass and like showers upon the herbs. So when you think of Genesis 1, we're going to go through this Torah portion like you've never gone through it before because we're going to look at things completely differently. But we have to understand it's the Word of God, but the Word of God has many levels. Okay, what letter is this? The mem, and it makes the M sound. Mem makes the M sound. This is what letter? The letter Yud. And then we have another Mem. Now, you'll notice this one is open and this one is closed because whenever that letter is at the end of a word, it is closed. Now, here's the thing. Every letter in Hebrew is also a word. It's also a number. It's also a picture. And so it's, we're going to open up the Bible. We're going to go really deep today. To give you an example, who can tell me what this letter means? Kosher. If you see this on a box of cereal or on anything, that means it is kosher. So the letter is a word. Who can tell me if the letter looks like this, what word it is? Well, first, you. The you or the yod means hand. So I want you to understand every letter in Hebrew is also a word. That's how Moses wrote that letter, Yud. And so you can look at it and know that it means hand. You lose that today. You can think of the Yud as a hand if you see the small little Yud. But when they see the letter Yud, anybody who knows Hebrew knows that is the word hand. Now, let's go back to this. What is that? Kellogg's. It's a word. A letter can be a word. What's this one? What's this one? What's this one? What's this one? So you already know letters can be words. And so in Hebrew, you have to understand, you, if you have a four-letter word, there's also four words within the one word. That has all kinds of meaning. So you have to understand things. So watch this. Here is... What's, what's this word? Ha, sha, mayim. The heavens, that's what I just showed you. And these birds are flying in the heavens. And watch what happens. Okay. And God made the expanse and he separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters uh, that were above the expanse. And it was so. And he called the expanse what? Heaven. 
And we see in the word heaven is, there is water. Do you see that now? Okay, so here is the first mem. There is mem, that's the water that's on the earth. Here is the letter yud, which is hand. There's the water up in heaven. And here is God's hand separating the two waters. So in that very one word, you can not only see heaven is made up of water above and below, but God's hand is the one that's separating the waters. These are waters that are open. These waters are closed until Noah's flood. And talking about Noah's flood, I go to uh, Google and I type in Noah's flood and I get an AI response. Okay, this is all the experts come together and they say, no, there is no evidence that Noah's flood happened as described in the Bible. This is the expert geology. There's not enough water on earth to cover the entire planet. How stupid. The water came from heaven. The water didn't rise up to the mountains. Okay, archaeology, paleontology, the story of Noah's flood conflicts is what is known from these fields. <laughs> Clueless. Species distribution. The story of Noah's flood conflicts with our species. But anyway, did Noah's flood really happen? The one thing we know for sure from geology is that a global flood never happened. Well, you know what? I've been to Alaska with Paul Claus, and we've gotten on a plane, and we've flown to, I don't know, like 20,000 feet. Or, I mean, we were way up high on a mountain, and there are seashells embedded in the mountains. Now, you tell me how a seashell is going to get up there about 20,000 feet. If, I mean, geology does prove it. Now, I may have some of those numbers wrong. But anyway, what I want to do today is make you so excited and your faith so strong. The odds are so out of this world when I show you what God has for you. You, you can't deny there's a God. Okay, I believe that God spoke the Hebrew language. He didn't say, let there be light. He said, yeah, he or. And Hebrew is the DNA of creation. Let me give you an example. What is that? Water, all right? But what is it really? It's H2O. So what I'm going to do is we're going to look at the Bible, but we're going to go so, you, I'm going to break the Bible down. And that's how you study the Bible. Now, for example, what is that? 15. Okay, Roman numerals, letters become numbers. It's the same thing in Hebrew. It's always been this way. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Okay, Beit is the second letter. Resh is the 20th. Aleph is the first. The Shin is the 21st. The Yud is the 10th. And the Tav is the 22nd letter. So from a place value point of view, that's their numerical value. But... From a numerical point of view, base stays two, but the race becomes 200. All left stays one. The shed is 300. The yud stays 10, and the tav is 400. So when you're looking at Hebrew, you have to look at it in the terms of every letter is a word. Every letter is a picture. Every letter is a number. This is why it comes from heaven. Now, what is this? Snow. But when you look at snow, you don't see anything big until you look at snow under a microscope. All right? So we just learned that the word of God is compared to what? Water. What is your relationship to the water? So many believers are still in the kiddie pool. And they love it. They love the kiddie pool. But others, they want to walk along the beach. Others will go dip their toes in it. But others say, forget that, I want to swim. And they're swimming in the word of God. Others say, that's not good enough, I'm going to snorkel. And others say, that's not good enough, I want to go scuba diving. And others go, forget that, I'm going in a submarine. And they're all in the water, but a different relationship. You have to understand there are 70 layers or levels of the scripture. Christians argue about, is it right, is it wrong? Maybe they're both right, and there are 68 other right answers. So this is the problem. 
As a matter of fact, look at this. So Proverbs 25, 2. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the honor of kings to search it out. God likes to hide things, and we got to dig them out. So I'm going to teach you how to dig. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law or Torah. So God will only reveal things to those who want to do them. If you don't want to do them and he reveals them to you, you'll be under condemnation. I remember a knife. And then all of a sudden I found out, what, a knife can do that? And a knife can do that? Well, guess what? The word of God can do lots of things. Same thing with a watch. How many of you remember Dick Tracy and he had his watch and he'd speak to it or have a phone? I always thought that was so cool. Will it ever happen? Well, guess what's it happened? Okay, so <clears throat> here we are. The word bray sheep. Listen to Psalms 119, verse 129 through 131. The first commandment was what? Let there be light. In English, that's horrible. It really, what God really did was say, exist light. Light, exist, be light. Okay. Now here, your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. The entrance of your words, what? The minute he opened his mouth, light's going to come out when he spoke. That's why light was the first thing. And it says it gives understanding to simple, and I opened my what? My mouth, and I panted because I longed for your commandments. Do we long for his commandments? We have to understand that the light, and he opened his mouth, what he spoke were commandments. Now, the letter pay. Oh, what's that letter? Pay. Oh, I right, good. Now, here's how you spell pay, okay? But what does, remember I said every letter is a word? What does the letter pay mean? Mouth. That's what it is. Now, to help you remember that the pay is mouth, let me put an eyeball in there, okay? Now, someone's speaking, okay? Pay is mouth. Now, pay has a numerical value of 80. The letter hey is the fifth letter. It has a numerical value of Five. Combined, the numerical value of the word mouth is 85. And what do we know? This is the year 5785. And we know from Revelation 19, his name is the word of God. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he overcomes the nations. The word of God is compared to a sword. I believe this is the year God is going to be speaking prophetically like never before, and where the nations are going to begin to repent, or God is going to begin to cut down the nations. Amos 8.11 says, the days are coming, says the Lord. I'm going to send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, not a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They're going to wander from sea to sea, north even to the east. They'll run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and they're not going to find it because they're looking at all the wrong places. Or like noise pollution, they can't hear it. You've got to go out into the wilderness. You've got to be separate. Now, this is uh, amazing. Look at Proverbs 6, 23. It says the commandment is the lamp and the law is what? Yeshua is the light. And the law is light because the law describes Yeshua, look at Psalm 104, verse 2. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. God covers himself in what? Like a garment. Can you see himself? He has light is all over him like a garment. So that light is not only the Torah. It's also Yeshua. Yeshua is the light. He's the living Torah. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? Here, I have it right here. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And you can see it right here. 
Vayomer said, Elohim, God, Yehi Or, exist light, and Vav, okay, Vayahi Or, and there was light. And you can read it right along here, and you see Yehi Or, Yehi Or, uh, be light exist, and light existed. Now, as I told you, every Hebrew letter has a place value, and there's 22 letters. Now, watch this. What did he say? Say, Yehi Or. Here it is. Yehi Or. When you look at the place value of these letters, the Yud is 10, the He is 5. Okay? And so, what is the total? 25. Now, or, the Aleph is 1, the Vav is 6, and the Resh is 20. And that equals 27. Now, most of you, I would think, know math, and you wouldn't buy a lottery ticket. What are the odds of winning the lottery? One in 100 million. Would you buy a ticket if the odds were one in 500 trillion? I say crazy. I'm going to show you and prove to you that God is in the middle of all of this. All right? What number comes between 25 and 27? See? You guys are good. There it is. But... 25 is a square. What do I mean by that? 5 times 5 is 25. 27 is a cube. 3 times 3 times 3. Out of the gazillion numbers in the world, 26 is the only number that fits exactly between a square and a cube. You have a square on one side, a cube on the other side. 26 is the only number in all billion gazillions. Only 26 fits between a square and a cube. Well, guess what? God's name is 26. The yud hey vav hey is 26. And on either side of him is Yahi Or. He's clothed himself with light. That's what it says. He covers himself with light as a garment. No man can write this. The word of God, no one can write this. And you, it's all, there's math completely intertwined in the word of God that is beyond man. My goal is to make you appreciate God so much. I want him to blow your mind so much. Too often we degrade God. We bring him down to us rather than us trying to go up to him. So watch this. How many of you, when you were little, thought your yard was the biggest yard in the world? I mean, the yard was huge until you grew up and you look at it and what a little postage stamp that thing was. Okay? Now, what happens if you go in an airplane and look at your yard? How big is it? It's all perspective. How about if you get in a way high in an airplane? Where's your yard? Where are you? All right. Well, let's go a little bit further. Here you are. You run into outer space and... Here you're going to take a view like you've never seen. Where is your yard now? Where are you? <clears throat> but watch, there's more. You don't want to go too far because if you end up heading to the sun, you're going to burn up. So we're going to come back to earth. How many of you have been to Israel? How many of you know it's a long trip? Going around the world takes forever. The earth is really big. Especially if you compare Earth to some of these other planets. Look how small Pluto is compared to Earth. But you know what? If you compare Earth to Jupiter, all of a sudden Earth is getting very small. Jupiter is big. Wouldn't you say Jupiter is big? But here it is compared to the sun. And there's Earth. And where are you? Where's your yard? Okay, let's take another look at the Earth compared to the sun. There's the earth. I'll make it a little bit bigger. And there's the sun. Our sun is what's huge. Would you say our sun is huge? 
Well, here's our sun compared to Arcturus. All of a sudden, our sun's pretty small. Jupiter is just one pixel. Arcturus is huge. But here is Arcturus compared to some of the other stars like Antares. And where are you? Well, here's Antares compared to Canis Majoris. Well, remember the Earth was that compared to the sun? Now, how many of you know light travels at 186,000 miles per second? I'll explain that more. The sun is so big, even at traveling 186,000 miles per second, it takes 14 seconds for light to circle the sun. But Canis Majoris, eight hours, going 186,000 miles an hour to circle Canis Majoris. Well, that means as far as the, it goes, you have to travel 186,000 miles per second, which means for 4,900 years to get there, you have to travel 186,000 miles per second for 5,000 years to get to that place. Let's make it simpler. That's 11 million miles a minute. That means 660 million miles an hour for 5,000 years. Okay. Are we getting an idea of distance? 5,000 years away, 5,000 light years? Well, guess what? Do you see this galaxy? It is 2 billion, 400 million light years away. Now, here's a little look at the sky. You see the little green square under the word what? And look, that little green square. See that little green square up there? I'm going to make it bigger. Right? There it is. From that little square, which looked like nothing, when you get the world's most powerful telescopes, look what's there. As a matter of fact, here it is, and I'm going to show you in that one picture taken by the Hubble telescope, there are thousands and thousands of galaxies, each containing millions of stars, each with their own planets cutting across billions of light years. Now, I'm going to show you this one in the bottom corner. Here is just one of the galaxies pictured, and it is 10 billion light years away, so you have to travel the 600 million miles per second for 10 billion years to get there. Oh, but wait, there's more. Here's Earth. This is our solar system. So this is what happens when you zoom out from your home to your solar system. There you are, but you're just a speck in the Milky Way galaxy. Here is the solar interstellar neighborhood, okay? Right there is the solar, here is our solar system. Our solar system is just a dot in the Milky Way galaxy. Here is our interstellar neighborhood I just showed you as part of the Milky Way galaxy. But guess what? Our galaxy is just a small part of our local galactic group of all the galaxies, which is just a little tiny speck in the Virgo supercluster, which is just a little tiny speck in the local superclusters, which is just a little tiny speck in the observable universe. Where are you? God chose this little speck to place mankind. Now, Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. All of what you see, God breathed. Let there be lights. Psalm 147, 4, and he tells the number of the stars. He calls them all by their names. Isaiah 40, this is why he says the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They're counted as the dust on the scales. He takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Are you seeing the magnification of God? That's how we wanted 
to begin here. And in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and we see darkness was on the surface of the deep, and God's spirit was hovering over the surface of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. I want you to see a parallelism. Um, when, one of the things when you study the Bible, beyond the 70 levels, there are four methods of study. The pardes means garden. The, it's an acronym. The pay, okay, uh, means the peshat, just the plain meaning of the text. For example, don't muzzle the ox means don't muzzle the ox. Okay, so that is the first layer of meaning. But there are like four different letters, which means words, like the last one, esod, means something that God has hidden, that he wants uncovered. Uh, but let's, let's move on here. I want you to know the waters represent the nations. And it says here in Genesis 1 that there was darkness on the surface of the deep. Okay, well, look at Revelation 17, 1. There came one of the seven angels that had seven bowls and spoke with me, saying, I'm going to show you the judgment of the great prostitute that sits upon what? Many waters. And in verse 5, he says, the waters which you saw where she sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So you have to understand in Genesis, when it's talking about the waters, it wasn't just physical waters. This is a representation of revelation when darkness, evil, was all over the nations. And then God brings the light. And we're to be the light that shines on the darkness. This is why it says in Isaiah 60, verse 1 through 5, now you have to understand when he said, let there be light, there was no soon sun, there was no moon, there was no stars. The light was the light of the Torah. Isaiah 60, 1 through 5, arise and shine, your light is come. He's speaking to Israel. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, darkness will cover the earth, gross darkness, the people. This is referring back to Genesis 1. But the Lord's going to rise on you. His glory will be seen on you. And the Gentiles will come to your light. Yeshua is the light. He's resting on Israel. The nations see the light. The kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes. They gather themselves together. They come to you. Your sons will come from far. Your daughters will be nursed at your side. Then you'll see and uh, flow together. Your heart will fear and be enlarged. Because what? The abundance of the what? That's referring to Gentiles when it says that. We'll be converted to you. The forces of the Gentiles will come to you. Hebrew parallelism is when they say the same phrase twice, but in a different way. So the sea in Genesis 1 can also represent the nations that are in darkness. Now, look at John 8, 12. Then spoke Yeshua again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so what happens before you can have life, you have to have light. So he creates light. All right. And he is the light. Now, look at Isaiah 40, 12 through 7. Who's the one that has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with the span? That's the hand. And comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in little scales, and the hills in a balance. Who directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, taught him? With whom took he counsel? Who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? The nations are a drop in the bucket, and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he takes up the isles as a very little thing. Lebanon isn't sufficient to burn, nor the beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All the nations before him are there as nothing, and they are counted him as less than nothing. You can see why. Look at, again, Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, everything was created by the breath of his mouth. He calls the stars by name. Now, the Haftor for this talks about the creation of Israel. So God creates the heavens and the earth, and then as a parallel, he now creates Israel. 
Look at Isaiah 42, 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom I, my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to who? Okay. You're either Gentile or Jewish. So who is he talking to? Yeshua. It's not the Jewish people themselves. This is an individual. He, not they. Yeshua is the ultimate Jew. Look at verse 3 and 4. A bruised reed he won't break. A burning wick he won't quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged until he establishes justice in the earth and all the coastlands are waiting for his Torah. Wow. But look at verse 5 and 6 of the same chapter. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens. He stretched them out. He who spread out the earth and that which comes out of it. He who gives breath to its people and spirit to those who walk in it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will hold your hand and I will keep you and make you a covenant for the people as a light for the Gentile nations. Notice, it is not just a covenant. He says to Yeshua, you are the covenant. It's not you're going to give the covenant. A person is the covenant. Yeshua is the covenant. Okay? He is the covenant between man and the creator. Not on stone, but the Torah on fleshly tables of the heart. Okay? So that is the key. And then it says in Genesis 1, 4, and 5, God saw what? The light and saw that it was good. And then what does he do? He divides the light from the darkness. This gives the concept of Havdalah, where you separate the Sabbath from the rest of the days of the week. And after the Sabbath, you divide it. Okay? You're separating the light from the darkness. And here... He divided the light from the darkness, and he called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was day one. So we saw that God saw the light. Well, look at this. Here it is. The light is the ha, or we know as light, but notice the Aleph Tav is there, and that kind of points to the direct object. But Yeshua is the Aleph Tav. So here we have the light, and the Torah is the light, and it's Aleph Tav Ha'or. You know what's amazing about that? Let's look at the numerical values, not the place value, but the numerical value. Aleph Tav is 401. The light is... Five, one, six, and two, you add these together, the light is 613. And we know there's 613 commandments in the Torah. As a matter of fact, this is Torah. Having the bait in front of it means in, in Torah. And if you add that up, it's also 613 commandments in the Torah. So here we see where it says God saw the light, that it was good. He divides the light from the darkness. I have the transliteration and the Hebrew there. But I want you to notice something. There is Aleph Tav Ha'or. Everyone see that? Now, over here, Ha'or, the light again. Down there, La'or. You see the Aleph Vav Reish. Everyone see that? Okay. Now, verse 15 God talks about the sun and the moon and the stars. Okay, he says, let them be for lights in the firmament to give light upon the earth. And I want you to see, again, Aleph, Bob, Reish. But look up here. When he says, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven, talking about the earth, the sun, and the stars, look at it. What's missing? The Bob is missing. So why does the word light all of a sudden miss the letter Vav? Because it's not the light of the Torah. It's not as perfect. 
And so it becomes defective, and the letter Vav is missing because the sun, the moon, and the stars are great light, but they're not as bright as the Torah. Isn't that amazing? See, you don't, in English, you don't see the missing letters they take out of the Torah. And so what does he do? In Genesis 1, 14 and 15, it says he creates the sun and the moon and the stars. And he says, let them divide the day from the night. Let them be for what? Let's take a look. Look at Luke 21. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. And in Genesis 1, 14, the number one reason was for signs. Here it is. Let them be for number one signs. What is he talking about? He's talking about solar lunar eclipses because no false prophet can manipulate an eclipse. Not only that, they speak in every language to every language. Then he says, let them be for seasons. Wrong Hebrew word. The word means the appointed times, like Passover, Sukkot, the Feast of Trumpets. Why? Because Passover and Sukkot are in the middle of the month, and you can only have a lunar eclipse in the middle of the month. Rosh Hashanah is on a new moon. You can only have a solar eclipse on a new moon. So what this is saying, not winter, spring, summer, fall, he's creating so people will have signs on the holidays to know it's God speaking. And number three, for days and years. He's not talking about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. He's talking about the Sabbath days, the years of the Jubilee, the Shemitah year. And he said they are to be number one. What was the number one reason? Signs. Well, guess how that works. You know, God is the best physician. I mean, not physician, but he is the great, he is the great physician. But he's also the greatest physics teacher. He's the greatest scientist. Here he said he wants them for signs. You know how tiny the earth is. Here's earth. I don't know if you can even see the moon. Here's the sun. How in the world can the moon, the little teeny tiny moon, block out the sun? How can you have an eclipse? Because in the sky, they look like they're the same size. Well, guess what? The reason why is the sun is 400 times further away, and it is 400 times larger. It's for, like my thumb can block out your whole head. Well, guess what? Tav is the number 400, and Tav means sign. And it's the numerical value of 400. He created them for signs. And guess what? It's 400 times further away, 400 times larger, which is the letter Tav in Hebrew, which means the word sign. The very word Tav means a mark, by implication, a signature. That's why the ancient Tav looked like an X. And that's why people, if they couldn't write, would put an X for their signature because the letter Tav means signature. And the ancient Tav looked like this. That was God's signature. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel's day, God said to kill everyone, but not anyone who has the mark. Well, guess what the Hebrew word for mark is? Tav. That's what it is. So what we're trying to do today is to magnify the Torah and make it honorable once again. Like it says uh, on your notes, I'll close with this. Look at this. Uh, Genesis 1, 14 and 15, he creates the two great lights. From God's perspective, they're both great, even though they're different sizes. And in John 1, 1 through 5, in the beginning was the Word, who was with God, was God. He was in the beginning, bare a sheet with God. Everything <clears throat> was made through him. Without him, not anything was made, and then was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. And look at verse 6 through 9. There came a man sent from God whose name was Yochanan. The same came as a witness that he might testify about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but was sent that he might testify about the light, the true light that lightens everyone that comes into the world. Going back to Genesis, let there be light, and the light is Yeshua. Now look at Isaiah 42, 21 through 23. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the Torah, and he's going to make it honorable. But these people are robbed. They're spoiled. They're all snared in holes. They are hid in prison houses. They are prey, and no one delivers them for a spoil. 
but no one is saying, restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken in here for the time to come? Do you know what the Hebrew word for time to come is? Aharon. And it means in the last days, the days that we're living right now, God is saying, who's going to say restore? Restore the Hebrew language. Restore the Torah. Restore the calendar. Everything we're doing here at El Shaddai is trying to fulfill this verse and restore everything back to God's people. Woohoo! Let's stand. Wow. Trying to look at where I'm at. We're going to continue when I, we come back. But let me come over here. Oh, God. All right. Avinu Mokenu, the father of king. We just come before you. I'm so thankful for all of those around the world that are watching, for all those around the United States, for all of those right here locally. We pray that you bless them. We pray that each and every one who is watching would join your team and magnify the Torah, make it honorable once again. We thank you for all those who bring any tithes and offerings to allow us or you through us to bring the light to all of the world. We just thank you so much in Yeshua's name. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay, are you ready? We're just going to pick it up where we left off. And I just want everyone to know, magnifying the Torah and making it honorable once again is a part of the restoration. That's why we're trying to magnify the Torah, make it honorable. We have a creator who loves us and wants to be loved as well. You know what it means, the fact that there is a creator? That's what gives meaning and purpose to creation. And God created every one of you on purpose, for a purpose, and that's what we need to realize. In Acts 3, 19 through 21, it says, Repent and be converted that your sins be blotted out, so the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And then look, that he can send Yeshua, Hamashiach, who was preached to you before, whom the heavens have to hold back until the times of the restoration of all things. So God is not going to send Yeshua back here until things have been restored. That's why what we're doing is trying to restore all things, it says, which God has spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. And since this is the year of the mouth, I believe this is the year those things the prophets have spoke about is going to be fulfilled like never before. We see in Ecclesiastes 3.1, to everything, there is a season and there's a time to what? That means you were born right on time. Whether you like it or not, you were born right on time for a purpose. <sighs> you know, God appointed a day in history for you to be born. That is amazing. He created you on purpose. And if you believe in a creator, your life now has great meaning and significant purpose. And it talks about when Yeshua was created, it was at the fullness of the time. It was the exact time for God to intersect history. Now, we're going to go back to dissecting the Torah on a deeper level. We're going to get out of the kiddie pool, and we're going to go on a submarine. Okay, we saw that breishit together means in the beginning. This is the word reshit, which means beginning. And the bait we know is a house, as a word and a picture. But the letter B or bait at the beginning of a word means in. In, in the beginning or the first fruits. You following me? Reshit, in Israel, Reshit is one of the names of the Messiah. He has a lot of, God has lots of names. The Messiah has lots of names. 
They know Messiah was to be the first fruits. And Reishi means first fruits. And so this was a name for the Messiah. So that means Genesis 1-1, the very first word, which means in the beginning, can also mean for the Messiah, by the Messiah, in Messiah, which is why Colossians says, in him was all things, by him, for him. Colossians is literally quoting. Look at your notes, Colossians 1, 16 through 18. By him were, was everything created that are in heaven, in earth, visible, invisible, whether they're thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created. What? By Rashid, for Rashid. The apostle Paul understood this concept. That's why he's, this whole verse, Colossians 1, is speaking of the first word in Genesis 1.1. This is where he got this from. It says, and he is before all things. By him all things consist. He's the head. What does it say? He's the what? He's the head. Listen to this. And then it says, <clears throat> uh, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the what? Beginning. And what's the Hebrew word for beginning? Reshit. The firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So Reshit is one of the names of Messiah. So What's cool is you can collect Colossians to the very first word of the Bible. You know where he got this from. Now, listen to Isaiah 48, 16, the verse just before the one you read. It says, come you near to me. Hear this. I, I, I have not spoken in secret from when? Rashid. From the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I. And now look at this. It says, and now the Lord God... And his spirit has sent me. Oh my goodness, this is the greatest verse in the Bible showing that it's a composite unity, the triunity of God. It says, the Lord God and his spirit has sent me. That is the key verse showing the triunity of God. Now, Look at Jeremiah 23, 29. It's not my what? Word. Like what? Yeshua is fire, says the Lord, and he's like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. So I have this little PowerPoint here. Je Jeremiah 23, 29, he says, is not my word like a fire. And then it says, and like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. And then I'm going to show you something very fascinating. His word is like a hammer. But look at this. Jeremiah 51, 19 and 21. Not like these is he who is the portion of Jacob, for he is the one who formed all things. And Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. And look what he says, Israel, you are my hammer. With the hammer, he's going to break the rock in pieces. He's got Israel in his hands, and he's going to begin to break the rock in pieces. Isn't that incredible? Jeremiah 15, 19 through 21. You are my hammer and weapon of war. With you, I'm going to break the nations into pieces. With you, I'll destroy kingdoms. With you, I break in pieces the horse and his rider. With you, I break in pieces the chariot and the chariot of the chariot. Isn't that amazing? Now, God, his firstborn, he aptly named Israel, which means to wrestle with God. And Israel wrestles with God all the time, especially after the Holocaust. Where are you? Okay, they're always wrestling with God. Okay, well, here we find in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's where we're at. But here's what's fascinating. Proverbs 30 verse 4 says, Who's ascended to heaven and come down? Who's gathered the wind in his fist? Who wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his, sir, his son's name? That tells you you have the father and the son. Same thing with Psalm 2, 7 and 9. I'll tell the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Now watch. Today I've begotten you. 
ask of me, I'll make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession, and you will break them with the rod of iron. Guess what? Yeshua is the, Yeshua is the hammer, okay, representing all of Israel. Look at Revelation 12, 5. She brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with what? A rod of iron. And Revelation 19, 15, out of his mouth goes this sharp sword with which he will smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Okay, so we have to see the other thing. There are patterns here. Israel is also God's firstborn, okay? But think about this. Everything is a pattern. So if Israel is God's firstborn on earth, Yeshua, the ultimate Israeli, is the firstborn in heaven. It's a pattern. Now, what's amazing, too, let me look over on that here. Okay, I want to show you this. Okay, this first word is Bereshit. Say Bereshit. Okay, I want you to remember, that's in the beginning. So here is the first seven words of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning created Elohim, the heaven and the earth. But here's a fourth word, the all left tov, that isn't translated into English. You've been robbed. You've been robbed of the all left tov. And I'm going to show you the importance of that here in just a minute. I want you to notice this. See, there it is. I made it bigger. But in blue up at the top, those first three letters are the, what are, what's the first letter? Bait, resh, aleph. Okay, and you'll see down there at the bottom, bara, where we get bara sheet. But notice the second word is the same three letters. So I want you to notice in Hebrew, there are words within words. Okay, not only is every letter a word, but you can have a combination within a word, and that means created. Do you see that? Okay, so here we have bara sheet, bara. In the beginning, created. Well, so who created? Well, let's take a look again. If you add a bait to a left, you have Av, as in Abba, the father. And if you add the N, you have the son, Ben, Ben Yehuda. And if you add this, you have the Ruach, the spirit. So in the very beginning, it tells us the father, son, and the Holy Spirit is the one who created all things. Now, here is Bereshit. We're going to separate the bait. And what does that word mean right there? What is it? Reshit. And Reshit means the first, specifically as the first fruit. Reshit means the first in place, first in time, first in order, first in rank, the beginning, the chiefest, the remnant. Okay, all of that. Now, I just underlined three letters. What is this? That's the resh, the aleph, and the sheen, which is rosh, like rosh Hashanah, which means the head. So here we have the word head in the word. Well, bait, what does bait mean? House. So here we have a letter. That's also a word, which means house. Well, guess what? When we look at this, a day with the Lord is a thousand years. We have seven words representing 7,000 year time frame. And from the beginning, when Adam was created to Yeshua was 4,000 years. And here he comes on the fourth day being born. And then 2,000 years later, we see the Aleph Tav coming back. Okay, well, guess what? It's got the Vav connected. The Vav is a nail at the end of the sixth day. It's Yeshua is going to come back, and he is the Aleph Tav who's been pierced, and they will notice him who has been pierced and mourn for him as their only begotten son. So we see the two comings of the Aleph Tav in the fourth day, and at the end of the sixth day, and this time he's got the nail. He's pierced. There are seven words, and a menorah has seven branches. And when John looks, who does he see in the middle? The Aleph Tav. That's the fourth <laughs> word in Genesis 1.1. That's who he is looking at right there. He is the Aleph Tav. Now, when I say Aleph Tav, in English, that'd be like A to Z. 
and A to Z means every word in the dictionary. This could also be read as, in the beginning, created God, the Hebrew alphabet. You following me? The word is Yeshua. And when he said, let there be light, he spoke Hebrew. It has letters. It has words. That's the language of heaven. When Paul fell off his high horse, he said, I heard a voice from heaven speaking in the Hebrew tongue. Because that's the language. Look at this. Revelation 1, 12 and 13. I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment. What is he clothed with? A garment of light. And here he is, clothed with a garment of light. Wow, he's seeing Yeshua. Isn't that incredible? But wait, there's more. Here we go. Since we're at the beginning, I want to show you some other ways of looking at things. Here is Adam being created, and he was born on what day? The sixth day. He was created on the sixth day. And what's the sixth letter in Hebrew? The Vav. So here he is. The letter Vav represents many things. It represents a hook, but it also represents man, because man was created on the sixth day, and that is the sixth language, or sixth uh, letter. Now, look at this. Let me see. In Genesis 2, verse 4, in the beginning, it says, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when God made man. And the word for generations is tol dot. Does everyone see that? Tol dot. But look in Genesis 5, 1, it has the same word, and it says tol dot, but something's missing. What is missing? The letter Vav is missing. Why is the letter Vav missing? Because Vav is a connection. It means a nail, like you're nailing two two by fours together. The reason it was perfect when God created it, but with Adam, Adam broke the connection between God and heaven by sinning. So now the Vav is missing. And the next 70 times in the Torah, it's never restored. It's always spelled wrong. But you don't see that in English. These are things you miss in English. When is the next time the word told dote is spelled correctly? Here we go. In the book of Ruth, chapter 4, verse 18, here's the generations of Peretz, and it's back. And it says, and Obed beget Jesse, and Jesse beget David, because he was the missing man who's going to bring back the Messiah. This is why in Matthew, it says the book of the generation of Yeshua, the son of David, not Adam, not Abraham, David. Now, I don't have time to go into it, but what's the numerical value of the word David? 14. This is why in Matthew, it goes on to say 14 generations from here to here, 14 generations from here to here, 14 generations from here to here. What they're really saying is David, 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 this is the Messiah. But unless you know what the 14 means, you don't see the connection. And if you don't know the Bob is missing, you also don't see the greater connection. Okay. All right, let's see. Now, I'm going to show you again how Hebrew is the DNA of who we are. You know the language that is closest to Hebrew? The chemical language, H2O, all right? Here we see he's creating man, the word Adama means earth. And where did we come from? The earth. And here is his name, Adam. The very name Adam means you came from dirt. And to dirt, we're going to go back to. Now, here we have Adoma, which means earth. But notice there's two letter U's. And what does the U stand for? Hand. When God made man, he used both his hands to make man. Okay, look at this. It says, Genesis 2, 7, 8, the Lord God formed man. And there's the word, using both his hands of the dust of the ground, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, and the Lord God planted a garden. Do you know what that means? 
The Garden of Eden was not part of creation. Yeshua himself came down, used both his hands, and planted the garden just like you'd get the nursery ready for your child. And guess what? This is why in Joshua 20, verse 15, Yeshua said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? So she thought he was the gardener. He was the gardener. He was. Okay. Now, in 2 Timothy 3, 16, every scripture is God-breathed, okay, which means even the New Testament is Torah. And then what do we see in Genesis 2, 16 and 17? The Lord God commanded who? Eve wasn't created when he gave the command not to eat of the tree of knowledge. She never heard it. She hadn't been created. The only one she heard it from was Adam, and he added to the word of God that you're not supposed to. Don't even touch it. And that's why when she touched it, she says, you're lying to me. He shouldn't have added to the word of God because she had never heard it. She wasn't even created. We see that in Genesis 2, 18 through 20, the Lord God said, it's not good to man to be alone. Well, this was after verse 17. So she wasn't there. And so it says, I'm going to create a help meet, which means someone to protect him. And out of the ground, the Lord God, what? Formed every beast. Okay. Well, here you have that word. Doma, and doma basically means like, okay? We are like God. We're created in his image. But here we have a pig, okay? And when it says the Lord God formed the beast, there's only one hand. It's the same hand. It's the same word formed, but when God creates man, the Hebrew word has two hands. But when he forms the beast, it's just one hand. But then again, you're not going to see these things. And then it says... Um, let me see. Oh, and whatever. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. He brought all the beasts to Adam and he wanted to see what Adam would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was their name. So Adam gave name to everything. Well, guess what? That's why in Hebrew, you can see the nature of the beasts. For example, here is the word for dog, which is Caleb. That's the word for dog. You know what Caleb means in Hebrew? It's a beast that is all heart. Kol is all, lev is heart. A dog is someone who gives you all of his heart. Isn't that amazing? Okay, so now we come to Adam. Here is Adam, and he's made of dirt, earth, right? Let me show you how this... Hebrew is so incredible. What, what do we have to have to survive? What, we're made of water, about 70% water. Okay, we're made of blood. All right, well, get a load of this. Within the word Adam, you have Dom, which is blood. The Mem, as you remember, Mayim, Mayim, or Mayim, means water. And here you have the word Adam in the uh, let's see, in James, it says, what is your life? It's but a vapor. And there is vapor, a, a fog that passes away. So right within the Adam's name, what do we see? We're created in God's image. We're a three-part being, all right? We're created in God's image. The Aleph stands for Elohim. And what else do we see? We come from dirt, we need to have blood, we need to have water, and we're about a vapor of wind that passes away. All of that is within his name. Now, what's amazing, like you have a lot of font on your computer, this is modern font, not the font Moses used, used or David used. I'm going to show you the name of Adam in the font Moses used. The Aleph means an ox. That which leads the way, that's strong. That's why they wanted to make a golden calf, because the ox represents God. The dalet means door. This is a tent door. The mayim, or mayim, means water of chaos, like a hurricane, not the gentle flowing water. So what do we see from Adam's name? He was the first to enter the door into chaos. So there's all, when you see these Hebrew words, there's more and more and more and more. 
Okay, now I'm going to show you more. So we're going to go to the beginning, and we know the letter bayit means house, but it means more than house. Okay, you can see it looks just like a house, but more than that, it means a home. There's a lot of houses for sale, but there's no family in it. Okay, bayit means a family. So do you know what that means? When I read the word in the beginning, it means it's always been God's plan to build a home by taking a bride and bringing forth his children. You can see that because it doesn't start with Aleph because Aleph is silent and God spoke. And so you got the bang, the bait. All right. Now, what's that word? Bereshit. How many believe Yeshua is the cornerstone? If he's the cornerstone, what happens if you knock out the cornerstone? Everything collapses. So what we're going to do, now we know that cornerstone is Bereshit, and we're going to put the pieces together where you know no man could build this. Okay? So here we go. Here I have, he's the cornerstone, and that word there means to lay a cornerstone. Part of Breshit, the letters in red, means to lay a foundation, to lay a cornerstone who we know is Yeshua. Here we have Bereshit, bara, which means created. So let's watch what happens. In Revelation, it talks about the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. I'm not talking 2,000 years ago. I'm talking 6,000 years ago. And in Isaiah 25, God said he declared the end from the beginning. If he declared the end from the beginning, we could go to the first word, which means in the beginning, to see how the end was going to happen. You following my logic? I don't want to just give you a fish. I want to teach you how to fish. So let's go walking into the house, and let's see what we can find in the word Bereshit. Here we go. The first two letters, bar. Bar Jonah, son of Jonah. Bar means son in Daniel 3, 25. And in Genesis 41, 49, it means grain. And do you remember Yeshua said, unless a grain of wheat fall on the ground and die, it remains alone. Remember that? Okay. Now, these first words we know means created. But who created it? The son of God. The son of Elohim. We know all three were involved, but here it's emphasizing on the son of God. Here I talked about Rosh. We know in Genesis 49, 26, Rosh means head. Ephesians 1, he's the head of all things. And then when you add the letter Yud, it becomes my head. Now, the word sheet in Isaiah 10, 17 means thorns. So, now remember, Rashit means the beginning. And here it is in the beginning. And so we have Messiah upon his head is a crown of thorns. All right. Now, Barosh in red in 2 Kings 19.23 means tree. And if you put the ute again, it's my tree. And what do we find on my tree? God is hanging. Now, so far we have the Son of God who created all things, upon his head, a crown of thorns, being hung upon a tree. Shy, in Psalm 68, 29, means a gift. And we know Bar is son, and so we see in the word Breshit, it's the son's gift. He freely gave his life, and God so loved the world, he gave his begotten son. Brit, in red, in Genesis 17, means covenant. It's the Brit Chadashah, the new covenant. And then, if we remember, the yud is a hand and the tav was a cross. It even shows the nailed hand of Messiah. And Brit means covenant in Genesis 17. And this is my son's cross that he has to bear. And then we see bayit, which means house in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 25. And in the middle is the word aish, as we saw in Jeremiah 23, 29. And so what are we finding here in Deuteronomy 33, 2? It says, from his right hand came a fiery law. 
And here we have the word uh, fire and the yud for hand. It's from my son's hand comes a fiery law. Now, when you add the letter yud, it becomes my fire. And if you remember, Nadab and Abihu offer strange fire. Only God's fire would be allowed in the temple. So we see that it's from the son's hand came a fiery law. Okay, now, the word reshit means what? First fruits. Okay, we see that in Leviticus 23.10. And in 1 Corinthians 15.23, we saw Messiah was the first fruit, which means the rest of us are going to follow. Okay, let me see where I'm at here. Because I haven't been going by my notes. Oh, wow, yeah, this, ooh, I got some really good stuff coming. Okay, now, Eshet, like Eshet Kayil, is wife, and then white, it's my son's wife. That's what he's looking for. And so what do we see in that Hebrew word, Bereshit, that God laid a cornerstone, and it was the son of God, who created all things, and he created bara, and he has a crown of thorns upon his head, okay, upon a tree being hung. He was the grain of the first fruits offering in the temple with the fire that fell from heaven, okay, which was his covenantal gift for his wife. He declared the end from the beginning. This is the beginning. It means the beginning, and he showed you all of history in the one word. You see why you can look at the DNA of Hebrew? Can you imagine? I can talk for one hour on one Hebrew letter. And if you go to our website, we have a series where I do this for every Hebrew letter for people that want to learn Hebrew. You actually can make it, I can make it fun. But isn't this cool? Now, we know the first word in the Bible is Bereshit, in the Torah. What's the last word of the Torah? What is the very last word in the Torah? It's Israel. Israel. So if you have a, a big piece of canvas and you take it real long and you circle it around and hook it together, the first word is Bereshit, the last word is Israel. And you'll notice there's a hook that's hooking them together. Well, guess what? The first letter is the bait. The last letter is the lamed. And they come together and it forms heart, lev. The Torah is God's heart. Now, the lamed means to control or to have authority. What does bait mean? House. So love is what's to control the house. This is why we love Torah. Now, if you look at all the letters of the Aleph Bet going around in a circle, right here, you have the word Melech, which is king. God is king. He is the king. And Aleph Lamed is El, as in Elohim. He is God. Okay, again, which means a strong authority. Now, how many of you know he's the light of the world? And in John, it says, he that lights every man as they come into the world. Well, guess what? They've now discovered a flash of light that sparks when a sperm meets the egg. He lights every man in the world. Then, how many of you like the begats? All right, John likes the begats. Here's the first 10 generations. We read that blah, blah, blah. But let's look at the Hebrew. Adam means mankind. When Cain killed Abel, Seth was appointed to take Abel's place, so they named him Seth because his name means to be appointed to. Now, do you remember Cain killed Abel, right? And God had told Eve 
she's going to have a man who's going to stomp on the serpent's head. Well, she had Cain and thought he was the man. So she named her next born Abel, which means unnecessary. Hi, I'm, I'm not needed. How are you? That was his name. Okay, then he's appointed. Guess who he gave birth to? Enosh. His name means feeble, frail, mortal. Canaan means a fixed dwelling place, like a house compared to a tent. Mahalaliel means God who is praised. Yared means to come down or descend. Enoch, we get the word Hanukha from, and his name means to train or to instruct. Methuselah means sent to die. Lamech means being tortured or beaten, and Noah bringing rest to quiet peace. So when I say these 10 names, I see mankind is appointed to feeble, frail mortality, a fixed dwelling place. But God who was praised came down to instruct. He was sent to die, being tortured and beaten, but brought rest and a quiet peace to all of us. You're not going to see that in English. This is why this is just the beginning of the most exciting year you're going to have as we go through all the Torah portions, and we're going to show you things that you have not seen. Now, let me jump here for a minute, uh, show you some other mistranslations in your Bible. Uh, Genesis 4, 25 and 26, it says, Adam knew his wife. She bore a son, called his name Seth, for God has appointed me. There it is, to be appointed to. That's why she named him Seth. Appointed me another seed instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. And to Seth him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. It actually, in Hebrew, says to curse the name of the Lord. Now, in Genesis 5, 3, it says, Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Okay, now let me ask you something. I'm going to blow your mind, seriously. Was Adam and Eve created as little babies with diapers, and God had to change their diapers until they grew up? Okay, let's say they were about 30 years old, roughly, right? But it was day one for them. Okay, and they go out and they have Adam and Eve, or they have Canaan, then they have Abel. Okay, so Abel is born... Cain is born. Cain is a year, let's say when Cain is three years old, Adam and Eve are two years old. They, they were created on day one, let's say at 30 years old. So when Abel is born, they're adults taking care of this little baby, but when Cain is three years old, they're only two years old. Are you getting it? Is anyone not getting it? Okay, well, are you, they were born at 30, so they're already adults when they're created. So they have a baby a year later, and they're just a year older than the baby. They've, because it says, look at this next verse. It says, Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Now, he may have been created at 30 but when he's 130, he lived 130 more years. Are you following me? So how old was Cain when he killed Abel? They had to be almost 128 years old. Because he was 130 when he begat Seth. You following me? <laughs> I mean, it's just kind of bizarre to think about. Anyway, then we see in Genesis 6, 1 through 3, when men begin to call, uh, multiply on the face of the earth, daughters are born to them, the sons of God, and the sons of God means the sons of God. It doesn't mean demons. The sons of God are not demons. The sons of God are believers. Okay? And he, they saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wise of all which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit will not always strive with man. He's still flesh, yet his days will be 120 years. That means God said, I'm going to destroy the earth in 120 years. Noah, he got 120 years to build the boat. And then in uh, verse 6 through 8, it repents the Lord that he made man on the earth. It grieved him in his heart. And in Hebrew, it means sobbing, difficulty in breathing like a child. He just can't hardly breathe. That's what God was experiencing. And the Lord said, I'm going to destroy man whom I created from the face of the earth, both man but look at this, and beasts, the creeping thing, the fowls of the air. Well, what did they do? 
<laughs> what did they do wrong? But he's going to destroy it all. He says, because it repents me that I made man, but Noah found grace. Okay, we're going to talk about that next week when we go into the Torah portion. Now, I don't know if you knew this. There were around 44 million people on the earth when the flood came. 44 million people. You do the math of uh, just 1% growth over 1,700 years because the flood happened about 1,700 years later. You have people living to be 900 years old. They're going to have lots of kids. And those kids are going to have kids. It's just about the force of multiplication. There's a 1% annual growth. You're going to have 44 million people that died in the flood. Let's see. Yeah, John 1, 8 through 10. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness to the light. That was the true light, which lights everyone that comes into the world. That's what he does. Now, here I have, this was about, because these are the 50-year jubilee cycles. You have 100, 200, 300, 400, about 500 years from creation. And here we have Adam and Seth and Enosh and Canaan and, you know, coming down. And then there's the next 500 years, as you can see, people being born. There, that bottom little cake is Noah's birthday. And then we keep going. Now, this is about 550 years each. And look at all the time that goes by. And then finally, the flood. The flood happens about 1,700 years after Adam. And then you come down, and then you have Abraham being born. And here he receives the promise. And here Isaac is born. And what year was Abraham born from Adam? 1948. The same year as Israel becomes a nation. So anyway, this is kind of... Uh, what you're going to experience as you enjoy the tour portions with us this year. Woo! And in case you did not know, Abraham was born the same time as the Tower of Babel and Nimrod. And we're going to talk about Nimrod and Abraham coming up. Let's stand. Sorry I went a couple minutes over, but I was having too much fun. Havinu Malkainu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much that you love us so much and you want the Bible to be fun and you want us to learn all the different ways that we can look at things so all of a sudden, oh my goodness, we're out of the pool and we're in the ocean and oh, how deep your word is. I just pray you would create an excitement in every single one of us that we want to know more. Create a thirst in us as the heart pants after the water. We just thank you so much for all that you're doing. And Father, we're so blessed that you not only want to bless us, you want to put your name on us, even as you said. Ivarekaka Adonai, Vaish Mareka, Yaer Adonai, Pandavileka, Bihuneka, Yisa Adonai, Pandavileka, Vyasem Laka, Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that most wonderful name, Aya Asher, Aya. Amen. One more thing I forgot to tell you. When God went to Cain and said, your brother's blood is crying out from the ground. Wrong translation. It's in the plural. All of the bloods, all of the generation that will never be born are now crying out from the ground. Amen. Thank you.